everybody. I hope you can hear me. Um, if I hear silence, that means yes. Hello, hello. Welcome to our program tonight. My name is Eileen Wong. I am a curator here at the Beach Museum of Art and a curator of the exhibition, Do You See What I See? Which we will be talking about tonight. And our guest speaker is Professor Elizabeth Anker, who teaches at the George Washington University. We'll start off with a discussion about Professor Anker's research and some artworks from the exhibition, Do You See What I See? And then we'll have you, the audience, join in the conversation. Before we get into the heart of the program, a few reminders. Closed captioning is available. Click on the CC icon at the bottom of your screen or at the top right corner. And many thanks to our closed captioner for tonight. This program is being recorded and the recording will be available later on YouTube's, uh, on the museum's YouTube channel. And there will be a transcript that goes with the recording. For the benefit of audiences who are primarily listening, I will offer brief descriptions of what we are discussing as much as possible. So I'll start off with a brief description of myself. I am a woman of Chinese descent with short, straight, dark brown hair. And right now I have a scar about one inch long running down my right cheek that I got from a fall I sustained while training in parkour. <laughs> I am wearing a floral top um, in light green, blue, pink, and white colors and a mint green jacket over it. So Professor Anker, would you give a brief description of yourself as well? Sure, and hi everybody. Um, I I have long brown hair. I normally wear glasses, but I don't need them, so I don't have them right now. Um, I am wearing a black short sleeve shirt and I have a gold necklace on. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to introduce everybody to Professor Anker. She is Associate Professor of American Studies and Political Science at the George Washington University. And she's the author of two books. The first one, is Orgies of Feeling, Melodrama and the Politics of Freedom. And the second book is Ugly Freedoms, which was just published this year in January. She's the co-editor of the journal Theory and Event and is a regular news commentator on TV, both national and international. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that K-State as the first land-grant institution established under the 1862 Morrill Act is historically home to many native nations, including the Kaw, the Osage, and Pawnee. Furthermore, Kansas is the current home to four federally recognized native nations, the Prairie Band Potawatomi, the Kikapu Tribe of Kansas, the Iowa Tribe of Kansas and Nebraska, and Sac and Fox Nation of Missouri in Kansas and Nebraska. Many native nations utilize the Western Plains of Kansas as their hunting grounds, and others such as the Delaware were moved through this region during Indian removal efforts to make way for white settlers. K-State and every university in the US are on indigenous land. The recognition that America's history begins and continues through indigenous contexts is essential to this museum which seeks to create decolonized spaces at the university and increase the presence, promotion, and support of indigenous and other traditionally marginalized K-State faculty, staff, and students. Okay, let me ask Professor Anker to start off our conversation by telling us um, about her research on the word freedom and her latest book, Ugly Freedoms. Professor Anker. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm really delighted to be here today to talk about freedom and to talk about some of the artwork in the exhibition. Uh, so I'll plan to talk for about 10 minutes or so. Um, so while storming the steps of the US Capitol last year, one enthusiastic rioter declared, I am here for freedom. 
And now freedom might see the wrong way for this person to describe their attempt to violently overturn an election and possibly hang the vice president. Right? As we know, freedom is perhaps the most cherished ideal in American politics and political thought. It's the foundational value of liberty and independence that the state is said to embody, that citizens are said to desire, and it's considered almost a universal ideal that so many people you know, um, invest in it. And yet more is going on here if we think about what the rioter is saying. He likely means the freedom to choose one's leaders if he believes that the election was stolen. And he also means the freedom of individual agency and authority over state power, right? The freedom to not be unjustly controlled by the state, which is a freedom that is central to something like the Declaration of Independence. So freedom here entails the capacity to block or challenge those who try to block his own personal agency. Now, of course, it would certainly be easy to claim that this man's actions in no way reflect freedom, that his attempt to overthrow this election and engage in anti-democratic anti violence instead completely opposes freedom's ideal. But I wanna argue that if we see things a little bit differently, the January 6th rioter can help us to articulate a complicated and unsavory truth about freedom, which is that popular freedoms in the, uh, in the US do entail not merely our celebrated practices of individual autonomy or rule of law or equal participation in governance, but they have entailed also subjugation and brutality and sometimes even racial and sexual domination. So freedom is, I wanna argue, both the highest ideal in American politics and sometimes it can also be the most brutal and that this ambivalent legacy of freedom demands a, a full reckoning. It's celebrated practices of freedom that we're all familiar with, practices like self-rule, practices like personal freedom or equal power shared among all. All of these are crucial for understanding and practicing freedom in America. These freedoms entail the ability to have a real say in the conditions that govern our lives and to live equally and freely among others. But when we take a step back, we can also see that sometimes large systems of domination like racism or imperialism have also unfolded in freedom's name, right? White supremacy has entailed claims that freedom can entail control over property, including the property that one owns, including human beings. And it, imperial control of other states, especially in the past was often understood to bring freedom to unfree people. Now, of course, freedom's not the overarching driving force behind either racism or imperialism, but freedom is wide enough to have justified both of them. And I think it's too reassuring for us to claim that things like racism or imperialism are only fake, that just like fake justifications uh, with freedom or that they you know, are just bad apples and they're not really reaching up to an ideal. Because I think this claiming it in this way preserves freedom as unequivocally righteous and is always hallowed. But I think the problem here is not just that these systems don't embody real freedom or that freedom has been subverted by certain people to legitimate their violence. I think the problem here, and this is what our January 6th rioter can show us, is that ideals of freedom have been legitimately practiced as subjugation and that this has happened at many moments in American history, not just in the present. I call these freedoms ugly freedoms. And this is where freedom is used to justify domination. And there's a long history of ugly freedoms in this country, right? From the start of the American experiment, the language of freedom only applied to a privileged few who actually lived within the country. At the time of the Constitutional Convention in Philly, only 2% of the population in Philadelphia was actually qualified to vote for it. At the same time, slave codes allowed white property owners to possess black human beings, creating what the historian Tyler Stovall has called white freedom, which I'll use his words here. He describes as the belief and practice that only white people can and should be free. This freedom for a white master also extended to the freedoms that included the freedom to torture people and to gain lifelong control over others. In the 19th century, claims for men's freedom permitted domestic violence against women because it was considered a husband's prerogative and privacy, a husband's freedom. While one of the most famous legal jurists in the 19th century, 
considered the American Blackstone, James Kent argued on behalf of husbands, and these are his words, the law has given him a reasonable superiority and control over the person of his wife. He may even put gentle restraints upon her liberty if her conduct be such as to require it. So in other words, a woman's freedom was at the discretion of her husband and a husband's freedom entailed the capacity to restrain his wife. In the 20th century, racial segregation was justified as the freedom of white people to control public space and to make their own business choices. Right, the infamous segregationist Governor George Wallace uh, said in 1963 when he was announcing his candidacy for president of the United States, he argued that his stance against in integration was, quote, our fight for freedom. And then he later justified it as, quote, the ideology of our free fathers, right? We could call this ideology of our free fathers white supremacy. And these are just a few examples of how claims for freedom have often justified domination and suppressed the rights of women, of non-whites, of workers, and of vulnerable people. It's certainly true that the language of freedom has been central to emancipation, to suffrage and the right to vote, to democratic movements of all kinds, but it's also justified violence and discrimination. And so I think we are seeing a rise in these kinds of ugly freedoms today. We see across the US that many states are banning the teaching of the history of racism and calling these bans uh, the promotion of freedom of thought. Some of them, the bills uh, that encapsulate this ban are called individual freedom bills and they specifically limit discussions about race, gender, sexuality, and discrimination, both in schools, but also in businesses, right, in human resource centers. Um, mask mandates were often rejected from the start because they were said to infringe on individual liberty, right, and oftentimes the, the movement against mask mandates was titled health freedom, even if that refusal to mask denied the freedom of movement to immunocompromised and elderly people and made entire communities more vulnerable to COVID. Uh, we see the Supreme Court sometimes cites religious freedom in order to justify uh, eroding civil liberties like employment discrimination and gender-based discrimination. Uh, each of these different actions uses the language of freedom to justify anti-democratic politics. They might block teaching particular ideas, they diminish employees' ability to have power in the workplace, and they can undermine public health. Every time people use freedom in these um, anti-democratic ways or ways that can justify discrimination, right? the problem is not that freedom is being misunderstood. And it's not even just that it's a cynical use of the language of freedom to frame bigoted policies. I think these types of freedom manifest instead a particular interpretation of freedom that we see at various moments in US history, a freedom that is not about expanding capability, but about exclusion and coercion. It's about limiting freedom to a privileged few. And today we're seeing more and more laws, caucuses, rallies, and social movements using freedom in this way, right? using freedom to erode democratic governance and civil rights and to expand the creep of authoritarianism. And yet I also want to suggest that we see vibrant political movements, vibrant artworks and legislation that are reclaiming freedom as a right for all. These are freedoms that continue to expand different Americans' abilities to both live a flourishing life and to participate in public affairs, right? In, go in participating and governing over the conditions of their lives. This inclusive freedom can sometimes take shape you know, in politics and in legislation. We can see it in laws countering voter suppression, like the Freedom to Vote Act or the John uh, Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. These bills argue that freedom requires equal access for all people to be able to vote. By make, and they made it you know, significantly, we're trying to make it significantly easier for all people to vote. In this, they promote a form of freedom that expands rather than contracts democracy and insists that freedom means all, all Americans must have equal power to shape governing systems, right? It is telling that this law did not pass in Congress. There are other laws that we've seen, um, laws that argue that freedom entails all people having a say in childbirth and reproduction. Uh, these are laws that aim to counter the overturning of Roe versus Wade and to reframe the Supreme Court's decision eroding Roe versus Wade as one of unfreedom. 
So New Jersey used freedom in this way. It passed the Freedom of Reproductive Choice Act, which draws on the language of freedom to argue that freedom means that all people determine their own futures regarding childbearing and birth control. And yet it's certainly these, these kind of use of, of expansive freedoms are not limited to the law or to legislation. I think we see it in artwork and we talk about some of the works that we see today. There's also a movement within the artwork called For Freedoms, spelled F-O-R Freedoms, which is all about using art to think about spaces of unfreedom today and how that can be continually, um, you know, how we can argue for forms of freedom that fight for equality, uh, racial justice, and you know, uh, racial and gender equality and sexual equality using art and using it in art in public spaces and in public forums. Um, we can also see freedom uh, fights for freedom in the workplace, the arguments about uh, freedom meaning that people have to have a say in their own working conditions, right? So not just freedom in our governing conditions in the political world, but freedom in the conditions under which we work and labor every day. And we also see robust social movements that argue freedom has to be central to issues like black, transgender and disability rights. These movements argue that democracy is central to freedom and they challenge structures of privilege that allow some Americans to undo power over others. Each of these movements, I think, argues that freedom must be about expanding government power. So in these different movements, we see a contest over the very meaning and vision of freedom, right? Is freedom for the many or is it for the few? Is freedom for the individual? or is it for everyone in society together? Is freedom about doing what I want or is freedom about supporting the flourishing of all people? Right? These different visions of freedom enact startlingly different politics. And I think they depend on what perspective we take and what we imagine freedom to be and how we achieve it. So in contesting the content of freedom, I think the goal of some of these more expansive freedoms is not just to say that freedom is always an unblemished ideal or to say that you know, other, everything, anything justified by freedom is always okay, but it is to counter both historic and current uses of ugly freedoms with different versions of freedom that show that freedom entails not only individual declarations of power, but a shared practice of collective equality and self-governance that freedom requires respect for all people in their differences and because of their differences. And at least at the very least, or even at its most valuable, that freedom must entail the struggle to end all forms of unjust hierarchies, exploitations and control. So thanks for that. And I look forward to thinking about these in the context of the art that we're looking at today. Oh, thank you, Professor Anker. That's, wow, that's really profound. <laughs> Um, so, yes, not only that the meaning of freedom actually keeps changing in definition, but it's almost, it's people's mission to keep redefining it in a way and refining um, how it serves people. And I would also say that, yeah, the, what freedom should be depends, it seems to me from what you were saying, you know, what happened historically and even now seems to me that you know the the ideal of freedom even depends on the perspective of the person um because i, I what really caught my attention was uh you saying well you know to implement freedoms for that serve all people not just a small group in a way you have to enact laws or governments have to interfere, which some people will interpret that, that as not like going away from freedom, isn't it? Yeah, right. Some people will say that kind of interference, right? If you understand freedom to always be kind of against the government or that the government is always a site of unfreedom, then any kind of intervention feels as if it is an impingement on freedom. But if you see the government as the place where all people have a say in shaping our futures together, right, then it, it seems that that kind of intervention would be necessary for freedom. So, or, you know, to, to yeah. ensuring it for, for, you know, for a larger society, and, right? And freedom is also not isolated. It's tied up with so many of our other values, which then shape what we understand freedom to be and how to practice it. 
Yeah. Wow. I, I hadn't thought of that, but that's, that's uh, eye opening. I think it helps me what you're saying, just help me understand, you know, the difference in points of view between somebody who's Republican or libertarian or positivist versus uh, somebody who is, you know, leaning towards the Democratic Party ideals, you know, and the belief in um, shared responsibility, which means that maybe you have to give up certain personal freedoms in order to contribute to social responsibility. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Or even if, you know, if freedom is not about or not only about, you know, me getting to do what I want, but if freedom is about how do we, you know, live in a society where we can all get what we want, mm -hmm. right? The, the, enacting that is going to look different. Mm -hmm. Right. And it is, it's, you know, is, is responsibility only on the individual or is it on society? And I think all those questions come into play. Yeah. Well, I, that's, um, that kind of, uh, how meaning of how the meaning of freedom changes on perspective, um, is something that, uh, my exhibition, do you see what I see explores and, um, I've been really fascinated with the idea, with looking at how different symbols mean different things to different people. And that's why I observe, you know, disagreements or heated arguments um, because the interpretations are different. And so I, let's talk about um, what the first work um, that I wanna show and I need to share screen. So just give me a moment. Ooh. Hold on, technical difficulties. I can't advance my slides for some reason. Is everybody seeing this? Can I get a... Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm not sharing screen, am I? Mm -mm, not, not right now. <gasps> Sorry. Try again. How's that? Everybody see that? Yep. Okay. There. Do we see this? Yes. So um, what you're discussing may, um, brought me to think more about this work that's in Do You See What I See? And this is called The Kneeling Flag by Archie Scott Gober, who is um, an artist, American artist based in Kansas City, Missouri. And a, a brief description, basically it's a sculpture a, pe a sheet of aluminum that's in a vertical orientation. And it, it looks like the American flag in a vertical orientation with stars section on the upper left and stripes on lower left and right, and all in black. So this is all in black. Bottom part of the flag is folded so that it looks like a kneeling figure with the right section bent to make contact with the ground like a bent leg and the lower left side is bent at a 90 degree angle, which looks like a leg with a foot on the ground and the knee above the ground. So I asked the artist about this. Um, the height of this sheet before it was folded is the exact same height of Colin Kaepernick, the football player who uh, famously knelt during the playing of the American national anthem and he was um, criticized for that and ostracized from the NFL. And I've been fascinated by this, what happened with Colin Kaepernick and the interpretation of the American flag. And, you know, the American flag is a symbol of a state and one's love of country. And how do you treat this symbol? I mean, it's still an object, right? And it's just a symbol, but some people interpret it as sacred and you can't mess with it or make changes. And uh, Archie Scott Gober here made tweaks to the appearance of the American flag. And I think that he's 
challenging people to think, you know, now is he being treasonous or not? Um, Professor Anker, I wonder if you'd like to start the conversation and tell us what you think of this. Sure. I mean, it's a really fascinating piece to me in the way that it's playing with this, you know, this iconic symbol of freedom, which is the American flag, certainly a symbol of freedom to Americans. Um, and obviously one, you know, he's intervening in a really heated debate about what does it mean to, um, you know, how do we treat the flag as members of this polity, right? The flag is kneeling. And so it's echoing Kaepernick's concerns and the larger movement in which he's kneeling, you know, to attend to, which is the reckoning with longstanding racism and injustice and specifically about, you know, police brutality against black men and all black people. And I think by having this kneeling flag, it's asking, you know, what, if this flag is a symbol of freedom, what does it mean that the flag has to kneel, right? What, what is the project of freedom here if there are people who are still, you know, pro protesting against forms of unfreedom and violent, racialized forms of violence? You know, how do we think about this symbol? The flag is also black, which I think is really interesting. Right. On the one hand, I think it shows a sort of solidarity with this black freedom movements, especially, you know, uh, black freedom movements against police brutality. But it's also the, these tones are very somber and there's almost a sense of mourning, right? A mourning, a sense of what America could be. Right. Or, or you know, and how is, you know, America not yet being able to live up to its ideal. Right. You know, the flag itself is not it's not fully raised, it's not fully erect, you know, in, in part, you know, a gesture to the sense of it's it, the unfinished project of the freedom that the flag promises. Wow, um, that's a great notion. You know? <laughs> yeah, and I were, and I, when I saw this work, um, I also, for me, felt like, you know, this symbol of the American flag, but altered, right, um, is, bringing up for me um, notion, the notion of patriotism, you know, because like you, you face this symbol of your nation, the American flag, and you're, 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 you're supposed to feel patriotic towards your home country. Um, and it, because of the reference to Colin Kaepernick, it's making me think about how do we define patriotism? You know, is patriotism blind allegiance and absolute loyalty and not being, a, being critical? Or is it patriotism where you love your country? And I, I love your idea that this flag is like a work in progress, you know, <laughs> it's not quite upright yet. And so is it, you know, is being patriotic seeing the flaws in your in your country and being critical because you want it to be better. Um, I think that there is that different interpretation, right? Some people will say, no, it's not about being critical. And others will say it is about being critical because the nation needs to improve. And that's where conflict arise when the, you know, two, two views like this come together. And I think that that is part of the reason for Colin Kaepernick being ostracized from the football league. Yeah, I think, I think that is definitely true. And you know, th these, this sense of whether the American nation is perfect as it is, or whether it has room to improve, right? You know, whether the union has not yet been perfected is actually an ongoing debate. And what does it mean to, to either criticize this, the, the, you know, the, the state for not yet enacting freedom um, and, and to push it to be more. And I think that's part of the, the history of African-American political thought, which has often said, you know, freedom is central to, you know, to, to what it means to be an American. So how do we actually push the nation towards real freedom for all people? And so this sense of a nation that is not yet perfect, but on its way to being perfected, you know, is something that we see in the 19th century. We see it, it's, it's part of what we hear in Martin Luther King's speeches. And even, you know, Barack Obama's famous speech in 2008, which he called a more perfect union, 
you know, in the sense of he is asking us to think about the union as not yet perfect, but as an ongoing project and the work of being an American is not to say that it's already perfected and done, but to be, to, but, but to be an ongoing project of making it more and more perfect. Um, yeah. I love this notion of um, being a work in progress, I must say. And I think, you know, my own feeling is that it will always be a work in progress because, you know, there's always something more to improve on. You can't achieve perfection. And I guess, you know, that ties in with what you've been talking about with your research on the meaning of the word freedom throughout history and from different points of view is, you know, people keep working on it. And I feel like you're also making that call, you know, that challenge that we need to keep working on it <laughs> and, and keep, keep refining and fine tuning and changing, you know, that, that definition so that more people can say that they have freedom. Um, yeah, it is. I think, you know, that, you know, the sense of ongoingness and the continual work that, you know, is part of, you know, perhaps we could say like even part of citizenship. I think that, you know, is central. And the perspective is also really important. So when we look at, you know, a piece like Kneeling Flag, right? Uh, if you view the American, you know, the, the kind of American is already perfected, then this artwork might seem like a desecration, mm -hmm. right? But if you see the American state as a work in progress or as something that needs to live up to its own, you know, ideals, then you can see this artwork as an incitement to that work. Wow. And once again, it depends on, you know, what, where, you know, what already are the values with which you bring to how you approach the flag or how you understand yeah. what justice and freedom are and who has them. Oh my gosh, you just made me see the sculpture in a different, <laughs> in a different light. This is amazing. <laughs> and I, we should move on to the next work, um, but I just want to throw out this food for thought for everybody. You know, what about the gesture of kneeling you know, I'm, I'm an immigrant here to the US. And so I've always uh, been baffled by how, you know, gestures like change or interpretations of a certain gesture change in the context. And in this case, you know, I mean, kneeling in any other context is a gesture of respect. And yet when Colin Kaepernick does it, because he, it, like traditionally people stand when the national anthem is played. Now, if he kneels, it's considered sacrilegious, you know? Like, why is that? It's a gesture of respect in other contexts, right? Yeah. Anyway, okay, we need to move on. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, this is so bizarre. I can't, I can't um, stop. The screen share and advance my slide for some reason. This is weird. Okay, I'm gonna need to get out. Um, okay, I'm gonna share screen again. Okay, and then Now, do we see this? Yes. Okay, so the next works we're gonna talk about are uh, prints by the artist Paul Rucker. And um, I'll just show you one of eight prints that's in this whole series called Forever. And as you can see, everybody, these look like US commemorative postage stamps, USPS, you know, collector items. and um each one of them i'll just do this quickly feature the stories and the images of people who were victims in the civil rights movements in the 1950s and 1960s i'll just move through this quickly all right now i'm going to go back to the first one and let's just focus on that um so this one features four little girls um, who were killed in a September 15, 1963 bombing in Alabama. And what Paul Rucker has done is created um, on one sheet, eight and a half by 11, the 
faces of the four little girls as uh, on a postage stamp, but they're not real, right? This is his artwork, so he, but they really look like postage stamps. And then another sheet on the left um, are big stamps with their faces, and then also um, their story. So um, to, I'd like to just read the story so that everybody, you can see how Paul Rucker has created um, these postage, or these prints. So with the four little girls, this is the text that he put on it. Um, early on the morning of September 15, 1963, four members of the United Clans of America, Bobby Frank Cherry, Thomas Blanton, Herman Frank Cash, and Robert Chambliss, planted a box of dynamite with a time delay under the steps of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, near the basement. At about 10.22 a.m., 26 children were walking into the basement assembly room to prepare for the sermon entitled The Love That Forgives when the bomb exploded near Abby Mae Collins, age 14, Denise McNair, age 11, Carol Robertson, age 14, and Cynthia Wesley, age 14. All four girls were killed and 22 additional people were injured. The Justice Department did not press charges on uh, Shameless until 14 years after the bombing. However, it wasn't until 2000 that there was an indictment of Blanton and Cherry. The testimony of Cherry's family and friends led to his indictment. Cherry had boasted about playing a role in the bombing, claiming to have lit the fuse, and even to have been reported as saying, quote, you know, I bombed that church, unquote. Throughout the entire trial, he could be seen in the courtroom smiling and joking with his lawyers. Both Blanton and Cherry were convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison. Those, that's the text on, on, uh, on these quote unquote forever stamps. Um, the artist, uh, Paul Rucker is a creative working on many different artistic platforms. And he has devoted his practice to telling the history of the American Civil War and the fight against racism in the US and how that history colors the experience of people of color and especially African-Americans today. Um, and among his works are a set of robes that he sewed, he sewed or, and an immersive installation using the interior parts of an actual bank that was entitled Banking While Black. And in addition, Rucker is a professional cellist and a music composer and a collector of artifacts related to the history of slavery in the US. So let's just focus on this um, in, uh, for the sake of uh, time management. And um, let's talk about this. Yeah, I mean, I think this whole stamp series is such a brilliant reflection on kind of whose lives get commemorated and what is the story of America that we tell publicly, right? Whose lives are worthy of centering in the American story. In all of these stamps are people who were killed during, you know, either fighting for civil rights, most of them, or some here, like children, innocent kids whose lives, Emmett Till, right, whose lives are being fought for. All of them were murdered by white supremacists, mm -hmm. right? They all died by the hand of white supremacy. And yet the stamps themselves, I mean, not only are they honorific, but they're also, they're bright and they're vivid and they're lively and they capture people, right, in these kind of, um, you know, beautiful background shades and where, you know, they're kind of, their eyes are alive. And, you know, they're not, it's not somber in that mm. sense. It's really a celebration of life. Mm. And I feel like part of what, you know, it, it, the story of the forever stamp is often, you know, the, the people or the images that are most iconic in American history. Part of, I think, what Paul Rucker is doing here is telling us that at the same time, you know, these stamps might erase the discomforting parts of American history, not the ones here, because I think these are, you know, is a reclamation project, but that, you know, in forever stamps and trying to appeal to the widest swath of, you know, an American citizenry, I guess, 
um, they only privilege particular parts of the American story, particular lives at the expense of others, right? And that they don't tell the more difficult and more complicated parts of what America is, what its history has been, and whose lives should be central to that. So I see Rucker is trying to argue that these are lives that should be central to that story, right? To people who, you know, either who lost their lives, either like he with, you know, freedom or people who are registering others to vote, registering black people to vote, mm -hmm. you know, like or you know, other people, Medgar Evers, who are central to the freedom rights movement, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and asking us to, to focus on them and to tell their story, you know, as, as part of the story of the fight for freedom in the, in the long history of America. Yeah, um, it, you know, again, the, the, these kinds of stamps, like the real USPS commemorative stamps are another, are iconic objects as well. And, you know, because they're produced by the US government, they carry this air of authority that, you know, it's, it's like this, the interpretation of American history through these stamps is the authority, like the definitive history. And I think, and, you know, Paul Rucker doing this, um, and we talked about this, you and me, um, that he, to me, like the stamps look real. It's, it's almost like you could use them. So for me, it's like, uh, he's almost like creating a counterfeit, <laughs> you know, and like, instead of counterfeiting money, he counterfeited postage stamps. And um, so I see it almost like an act of rebellion, you know, like he's gonna counterfeit stamps and he's going to put um, figures in history who deserve to be remembered, whose stories need to be remembered. And yet um, the US government is keeping quiet about them because it shows the ugly side of what the US government or you know certain American citizens have done, right? Yeah. I mean, I love thinking about it as a counterfeit because the point of something counterfeit is also to use it and to have it circulate. So right, if the point of these stamps are like, how do we, you know, use them or to make their stories, you know, so normalized that they they can easily slip in as counterfeit, that they circulate throughout, in, you know, yeah. postage and things yeah. like that. Um, yeah, I think it's really powerful. Yeah, and now that you're you're saying that, you know, the idea of circulation, like, um, it really makes me think about, um, you know, graffiti and street artists. You know, street artists create stamp uh, stamps or stickers, right? Uh, uh, images or words that that in a way like rattle against, you know, certain issues in society that they're 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 rebelling against, and then they put all the stamps all over the street, you know, <laughs> illegally, but letting everybody see it, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah, a kind of tagging, a public tagging. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah, and I just want to point out that when I was studying these stamps really closely, the texts all, um, some of them, I, I haven't looked to see if every one of them has it, but a few of them have typographical errors or um, punctuation mark misuse. So instead of a period, there's a comma. Uh -huh. And I thought that was fascinating, you know, that he did that. Um, I, I feel like there's intention in that, you know, that in a way it's almost like, um, you know, the collector, uh, the collector item where it's like the, the mistake that then, you know, they discontinued that and then they did another one. And so that one becomes really rare. Yeah. Or like the lived hand, right? It shows that, you know, that there was like a human behind it, you know, making choices and, you know, it, it, yeah. it you know, brings that to the fore as well, almost brings the artist to the fore or the oh creator. Oh my gosh, yeah. you're so right about that. It's true. <laughs> yeah, it's like revealing the humanness, the humanity behind yeah. these, um, these images and these texts that look so official that they're almost like omnipotent or you know what I mean? Like the voice of authority that's like bodiless. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's really great. <laughs> All right, well, we could talk about this forever, but let's move on to the next work. Um, and I know you wanted to talk about this very much, Professor Anker. 
So here we have uh, Hammer and Sickle, which is a painting by Andy Warhol. Um, and it, this was made in 1977. And it's a painting out of 24 that he painted. So he made a series of 24 very large Hammer and Sickle paintings. And then on top of that, he also made four prints of Hammer and Sickle and many preparatory drawings. So this was uh, clearly a subject that he was fascinated with. And um, the, the inspiration for um, this series was um, him going to Italy in 76 and seeing the <coughs> hammer and sickle symbol that represents communism all over Italy. And it's because at that time, um, there was political change in, in that country in Italy and the Communist Party won more seats in the government than they had ever done before. And so um, there were all, you know, street art all over the, all, all over the country with the hammer and sickle symbol. And Andy Warhol um, is an artist or was an artist who was fascinated with symbols and what they mean and how they get mass produced and how that meaning changes, you know, through mass production. And so then he made this uh, series of paintings, prints and drawings of the hammer and sickle, but um, what I'll point out is that if you look at his painting, the hammer and sickle are actual tools. And it's not, you know, the flattened, very graphic image of hammer and sickle as a symbol that is used for communism and for the Communist Party. And that was intentional. And so, um, you know, you have the hammer and sickle here against a white background. Um, the hammer and the sickle, the objects, appear to be casting shadows on the white background, and the shadows are in, in shades of red and orange. And, you know, I, this painting is just fantastic in person. Um, so I would urge all of you who can, who are in the area or will be passing through Kansas to come and see this painting at the Beach Museum of Art. Um, but I feel like Andy Warhol is, with this series, changing how we see the hammer and sickle symbol by almost coming back to reminding us what the objects are. And uh, Professor Anker, what do you think? What are your thoughts about this painting? Yeah, you know, I'm, re I'm really fascinated by it because the symbol of the hammer and the sickle is so freighted, right? It mm -hmm. either symbolizes, you know, the USSR, it symbolized communism, you know, and, and communist revolutions. It's a, you know, a sign of, you know, industry and farming and it's painted here in red, which in the US is always associated with communism, but in a scary way, like the Red Scare, right? And here, you know, Warhol seems to be separating out these objects from that context. I mean, obviously they're still in red and he's echoing that because it's positioned in the familiar way of the hammer and sickle, but we can really see them here as, as objects and as tools, right? That, that things that are used in industry, things that are used in farming, right? And so it's these, you know, objects that become stripped from the political Mm -hmm. and that are stripped from history and are almost, you know, kind of taken back to their object use and, and turned into pop art at the same yeah. time, you know? So, you know, in many ways it, it aligns with part of what we've seen Warhol do before mm -hmm. in sense of turning objects, you know, into, into pop art. But given the weighted symbolism of what these objects do, the way in which they stand in for entire swaths of political systems and mm -hmm. ways of organizing humanity, you know, to, to kind of take, to strip them from that space is, is something I think is, you know, is, is, is dramatic and really heightened in this particular piece, especially, you know, when you see it in person because, you know, it, it's larger than life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'll, um, well, as you guys can see from the caption, it's 72 inches by 86 inches. It's, it's really big. And he did several of them of that size or close to that size. You know, the 24 paintings in the series, a lot of them are huge. Um, yeah, but what I thought 
was really playful about this was, you know, yeah, like he he took the hammer and sickle symbol and and reverted it back to the actual object and and then you know reproduce them yeah <laughs> and so i feel like it's almost like he's bringing back the ordinary um air of it like the, like really reminding people that these are just ordinary things and yet in our mind we have made them loom large you know so i feel like in a way, I mean, Andy Warhol has said he's like, you know, the artist who is very much interested in business and art is business, you know, so he definitely, in a way, like, you know, is definitely anti-communist in that sense. Um, so I, again, just like the Paul Rucker postage stamps or fake postage stamps, it's like rebelling against the, the, the ideals that the hammer and sickle have come to embody and he's like like you said you know stripping them of that yeah he's asking for a different perspective on these objects and one that is a perspective that then takes it out of the almost of the realm of political signification mm -hmm. and puts them back into the realm of economic signification right i mean in the sense of this is the stuff that we use to make food and that we use to make the objects that we need to live yeah yeah, it kind of takes them off a, a kind of political throne almost. I, yeah, oh yeah, exactly. Oh, that's a good way to put it, you know, taking out of the political throne. And in a way it's like becoming common again, you know, the yeah. tools that common people use. Yeah, becoming useful again. Yeah. 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 Well, I'll open this up now to uh, the audience and um, have people chime in comments and questions to, either Professor Anker or me, um, let's talk. Eileen, we have a question from guest Greg Miller and his comment is, I see that the flag is called kneeling, but it very much looks like a bench, something one would sit on. And if you were to sit on, sit there, you are looking away from it and you don't see it. It's then unspoken, unseen background condition for sitting, but note, not lounging, the seat is not sculpted it's flat and unforgiving. It'll hurt your butt after a while. Also, it's not a bench for more than one. You sit alone, which is to say patriotism here is an isolating and lonely experience, more akin to how Arendt thought of totalitarianism. It's an ungenerous bench, but also because it is folded and somewhat stunted, it's an ungenerous and generosity uncomfortable with itself. Mm -hmm. To sit on the flag cuts both ways in the sense that it is a sign of disrespect to a symbol, but it also shows a longing for the kind of warmth presumed in being wrapped in the flag. There is no enveloping here. Wow, that's that's a really great comment. And I'll just say that, you know, if you imagine yourself sitting on this flag, um, my colleague here, the, one of my colleagues here in the museum pointed this out. He's our exhibition designer. He said the orientation of the flag is actually um, the orientation of like an athlete draping the flag on their shoulder. Because, you know, as you can see, the flag, the orientation of the flag is not the way it is officially. But if you, if you have, you know, if you imagine yourself sitting on it and the flag behind you, then it's the, it's position you know, say when Olympic athletes celebrate their gold medal and they have the flag draped on them. So um, that's a thank you for that um, observation. And yeah, it's it's uh, it makes us think about the orientation of the flag here. And, and you know, it's not in the proper orientation. And yeah, I just want to add, I also think that's an incredible interpretation of what's happening in the artwork. Mm -hmm. um, and I love how Greg is describing it as 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 painful, as isolating, and as stunted. Because you know, when I first was looking at this art object, I accidentally referred to it as kneeling chair. And so oh, I also did. initially, right, you know, right. My my thought was it was also a bench. And then thinking about Greg's interpretation of its coldness and isolation, right? It reminds me of public architecture that the kind of anti-homeless public architecture where we used to have a, you know, a, a city bench for lounging and now they cut the benches so that they can only be for one person and they're rounded and 
uncomfortable so that you cannot lie down on them, right? And there's an echoing of that kind of bench work that is isolating and individuating. And that is, you know, a longing for a warmth and perhaps you're looking, you know, wh where are you looking for that kind of longing and, and warmth? You know, can, is that something even like, you know, a state or a patriotism or a flag can even provide? So, yeah. yeah, thanks for that. Wow, thanks for the observations. And this next question is posed by our colleague here at Beach Museum, Luke Dempsey, who's our exhibition designer. And his question is, why do you think Warhol created such a distinct shadow that is formally as important in the composition as the hammer and sickle themselves? I think that's a great question. I mean, you know, I, and I've actually been wondering this myself because at first when I was reading it, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't see the shadow and mm -hmm. it, it took me a while to realize what was happening. And I think, you know, there's something ominous about a shadow and we see the shadow you know it, it's kind of darkened in particular ways but then it also uh, you know I, I think it it once again is kind of removing it from where you might want to imagine the ominousness of a hammer and sickle I feel like it's almost playing with a kind of Americanized interpretation of what we imagine in, in, in the kind of symbolic structure, the hammer and the sickle to be, but then it's also pushing back against it by making it red mm -hmm. and by making it not, you know, that th it's sharp, but it's not threatening in the way that one might expect or the way something like that might have been read in 1976 or 77. Okay, I, I have a totally different look. Oh, cool. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna suggest, what if we look at this red, and um, orange color fields as being imposed on the hammer and sickle. So they're not shadows, mm. but they're colors imposed on them. And, you know, if you look at the way he has painted the colors on them, they're not exactly aligned. So it's almost like, you know, when you do mass produce like newspaper print or or magazine where it, the, the printing didn't align correctly. So like it's like the colors and the image are slightly off. I, I suggest how about we look at it that way. And so, you know, hammer and sickle, they're tools. And we have imposed, or uh, uh, Andy Warhol is suggesting that in this narrative, the color red, okay, let's say it symbolizes communism has been overlaid on these tools. So it's like meaning that people have overlaid on them, but it's not part of them, right? It's not a shadow. And I actually think that's great. And you know, when you actually look at the objects and you see the way that he's actually even through the color field bringing texture to like the, you know, to the top of the hammer and to the handle of the sickle, you know, th that texture does something different than the redness, you know, that yeah. is maybe, as you might say, placed on it. I think that's great. And, and actually, so you can see the shadow, the actual shadow are the, is the dark, right? Like the, the yeah. second image, you know? And that shadow has a different color field on it. It's an orange, not a red. So it's, it's like a different interpretation put on the shadow. And so for me, now I'm seeing this and uh, Luke, thanks for that question because it like jolted my mind to think of this. <laughs> that, you know, it's like these layers of meaning that are imposed on these simple objects and tools that are just tools and yet people put meaning on them and they don't quite fit, right? Because the colors don't quite align with the objects. And even the shadows don't quite align, right? <laughs> it's hard to figure out where the light would be that would have a shadow in, in each of those ways, right? Like the lighting itself is not coming from a single source, or at least not one enough that would make it align in that way. Yes, that's correct. And here I can, I can share a tidbit from my research on this. Uh, Andy Warhol basically had his assistant, studio assistant, Ronnie Cutron, go to Chinatown, a hardware store in Chinatown in New York, buy hammer and sickle, and then bring back to the studio and then play with lighting and take photographs. So there were like tons of photographs of the light in different positions and even the hammer and sickle in different positions. And, you know, so different iterations of the shadow. 
And then he used all of those photographs to do his 24 paintings. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you're totally right about that. You know, I mean, they played with lighting. Yeah. yeah. And in some cases, it's, you know, more than one source. Yeah. So again, I feel like it's confusing it, right? Like you don't yeah. quite understand what you're seeing. Which if we, again, think about this as, you know, the symbol, then it's like the symbol confuses us. Yeah. And we become a little bit disoriented when confronting it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of our one of our guests, Catherine Slogic, who is also our education curator, has made a comment as you've been speaking. And she says she would also point out that the tools have American and English markings on them which pulls them out of the Russian and communist association. And I think that's a really interesting point. Yes, very, mm -hmm. very observant. And, you know, um, I think most people are in our audience can see kind of the, the brand on the handle of the sickle, um, though, pro you know, not as clear as maybe in real person. But yeah, thank you for pointing that out, Catherine. We also have a question from guest Melissa Pohl. And uh, she starts off by thanking you, Dr. Anker, for the wonderful talk. Mm -hmm. And she asked you if you could please address more about the word freedom coming into play during the period of COVID. Sure, I'm happy to talk about that. I mean, you know, a lot of the things that I'm looking like looking at, like the insurrection, happened during the COVID times. Um, but I think when we look at how freedom is used in relation specifically to COVID and to the health freedom movement that came about after COVID um, or, or during COVID and really at its earliest beginnings, right? There were a lot of claims that um, adhering to mask mandates or to getting um, vaccinated were infringements on individual freedom. And so what we see here are claims that freedom is about, you know, it is about bodily autonomy, which there's certainly a long history in the US of on both sides of the political spectrum. But there's also a sense that what that entails in this particular moment is a refusal to be in relationship with other people, right? Like a refusal to see oneself as part of a community. Because certainly in those early days and especially before people understood how COVID traveled, before we had vaccines, right? Um, you know, not wearing a mask can literally expose other people to death, especially immunocompromised people, elderly workers, uh, you know, people who were forced into essential work conditions, and oftentimes those are with worse health care and they're less remunerated. And so there was a, a kind of claim at this moment that if mask mandate was an infringement on freedom, then freedom meant the capacity to be free from recognizing how one is connected to other people and also free from recognizing how we make other people vulnerable and put them at risk by our claims, right? So in that sense, freedom is never about community. It's never about community care. It's never about health, which is always a social phenomenon, right? Our health, if COVID's taught us anything, it's that our health is so deeply connected to those people around us. Um, you know, but, but there's a way in which that claim of individual freedom tried to fantasize that sense of vulnerability and interdependence away. So I hope that that's helpful. <laughs> wow, that's very insightful. Thank you. Uh, Jen, do we have other questions? Um, Luke has, has weighed in with another comment about the Andy Warhol piece. And he states that the handle of the sickle has writing that is in English. And one of the other paintings has champion number 15 and true temper noted upon it. True temper is a company that makes golf club shafts. Hmm. So I, I think he's suggesting that Warhol was on some level playing <laughs> with his audience in, in, in amending the different things that were printed there. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, from what I understand, um, he would, something like an object like that, he would actually copy pretty faithfully. And so, you know, um, whatever is on there is what he paints. I'm not sure that he would actually alter the appearance of the object to create more meaning. You know, I mean, just think of his Campbell soup cans. They're all like deadpan representations of the Campbell soup cans. 
But you know, I think he's also in that sense pointing out that even in just showing you an object, you know, what you bring to it like creates so many interesting layers of meaning based on your um, background and what you know. So, you know, that's the beauty of art, right? And and the genius of what he created. And are there any other um, questions uh, or comments? Greg Miller, who made the initial comment at the beginning of our Q&A, has an additional comment that I'll read to the two of you. Uh, he states, I like how both Rucker and Warhol use images which are replicable. Mechanical reproduction, reproducibility is behind postage stamps and behind Warhol's screen printing technique. But the faces on Rucker's stamps are very individuating. Professor Anker mentioned the eyes as being real. In contrast, the hammer and sickle, though real objects, are themselves mass produced and merely examples of a kind. I think this makes Rucker's work more searing, more melancholic, there's more pathos, and Warhol's object is very beautiful, very seductive. Rucker's seems closer to piety and to the weight, for example, of Coltrane's Alabama, written for the four girls. Wow, thanks for those comments. Well, we this has been such a fun conversation, but I do think that I need to put an end to this and let people go off uh, for their evenings. Um, I want to thank you, Jen, for being our uh, web host extraordinaire and keeping everything running smoothly. Thank you so much. And thank My you for closed captioner. And so um, I will say goodbye to everyone. Um, you are, well, you know, you can log off. We are done with our program. Thank you so much for attending and please, attend our next one, which will also be hosted by me on October 6th, and we'll be talking about migrants and immigration and borders. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.